Steve. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. This is also my first time at API Days Mediterranean and my first time in Spain. I've wanted to visit here for a very long time and have never managed to, so I'm really excited. I actually walked about 10 miles yesterday just around the city looking at stuff. Uh, that's why I didn't show up at the party last night. I took a nap instead. Um, so uh, today I'm here to share with you a project of mine that I've been working on for a couple of years now. Um, it's called JSON API. As you can see, finally, since my computer is acting up, um, I, uh, I live, I've lived in New York for about a year now, and more specifically, I live in Brooklyn, so I have certain like legal requirements when I visit other places, so I'm using the Moleskine uh, in handwritten notes rather than slides, because there's a certain hipster quotient I'm required to fulfill to represent Brooklyn adequately to the rest of the world. Um, so I basically don't have very many slides. I'm not going to be like reading the spec to you or anything. I just put this page up there because I have some things I want to tell you about it, but largely I'll be speaking from my handwritten notes. This has nothing to do with my computer not working, of course. Uh, I've sort of slowly been transitioning code talks without lots of code into just reading out of a notebook, and it, it means that computers don't get involved, which means it works much better. So, um, Okay, so this talk is split up into three separate parts. Um, they sort of build on each other. I sort of go from the most abstract to the most concrete aspects of doing this. So the first part is the theory of JSON API. The second part is the history of JSON API. And the third part is the practice or the current status of JSON API. Um, if you're not familiar with me or my work, um, I historically have done a lot of work in the Ruby and Rails community. I actually have a, a Ruby tattoo. Um, I also have a Perl camel too, if you like Perl a little bit better. Um, and, uh, but nowadays, I work for Mozilla on the Rust programming language. So uh, we've got a couple weeks, less than two weeks until 1.0 for that. So that's what I'm doing these days. Um, my work on Rails is what got me interested in APIs and HTTP in the first place. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but uh, fun fact about me, I almost got an English degree instead of a computer science degree. Uh, I actually applied to go to grad school in English, and they accepted me. And then they're like, surprise, you have to pay money. And I was like, surprise, I'm not doing that. Uh, so. I didn't actually get my degree, but oh well, I still read all those books and sound like an English grad student sometimes. I apologize in advance. Um, okay, enough, enough backstory stuff. Let's talk about um, the theory of JSON API first. So uh, as I mentioned before, Rails got me interested in APIs and HTTP. And I think that Rails has done a significant amount of good for the world of computers and APIs, and also a significant amount of terrible things to the world of computers and APIs. If you're not familiar with Ruby on Rails, uh, this topic is not super specific to Rails, but um, I'm going to talk about it a little bit up here at the front. I apologize if you, if you don't like Rails or if you know this already. Um, but Rails is sort of defining characteristic. What makes it special as a web framework is this idea of convention over configuration. Now, a lot of different web frameworks have adopted this since now. So if you weren't around back in 2005, this was kind of a revolutionary idea that 80% roughly, of course, all statistics are made up, right? But 80% of the decisions that we make as developers are actually irrelevant. Um, I don't think that that's, uh, it's not very comforting as a programmer, but we can spend a lot of times arguing over details that don't actually matter. An example of a, an argument that we can have that doesn't actually matter is, if you have model classes, should they go in the top level directory uh, under their name, or they should be in a subfolder named models, or maybe app models, or something else? We as programmers love arguing over irrelevant details, and so you can spend a significant amount of time arguing about the way that your application is laid out, or you can just put everything in app models for every application and just not worry about it and move on to doing your productive, actually building the application. And so what Rails did was it sort of came up with these conventions, and rather than you configuring the way your project work, you would use these conventions uh, instead. And that meant giving up a little bit of control, but it also meant that you were ridiculously productive. So um, my old boss, uh, the job I used to have a long time ago, uh, told this story about how he, at the time, again, uh, things have gotten a lot better. At the time, he was building uh, another project in a different language and framework that I won't mention because it's irrelevant. But he had spent about the first week just setting up his project, including large amounts of configuration files. Um, and then he saw the 15-minute Rails blog video happen where the guy built an application an entire application in like 15 minutes, and he threw away his project and redid it in Rails and got further in that first week than he had in the two weeks of setting up stuff before. Um, so this idea of convention over configuration is very important. And so what happened was is that this spread into the rest of Rails, not just the way that your files worked. So um, Rails, being a web framework, has a lot of HTTP stuff involved. 
And this, this might sound a little silly today or to the people that are attending an API conference, but a long time ago, um, we used to think that get and post were the only HTTP methods that web developers would ever actually use. Uh, when I paid a gratuitously large amount of money for my college degree, uh, oh yeah, uh, I love mentioning this every time I'm in Europe. So I got out of school with about $72,000 in debt for my bachelor's uh, education over in the States. So that's how we roll on that side of the ocean. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, but I didn't even go to a particularly special or good school that's just kind of like average these days. Um, but in that, for that $72,000, I learned that the only difference between get and post is that get puts parameters in the URL and post goes into the body of the, the like, request. This is literally what my professor has told me. And this is not to say that my professor is dumb. Uh, he didn't actually specialize in the web. He was specializing in other things and had to teach the web class because someone had to. Uh, so worth the money. Um, but this was the like, state of the web development at that time. And most programmers, you know, we want to build web applications. Like, even most people that are building web applications don't care a lot about HTTP and its semantics specifically. Um, and so one of the things that Rails did that was very controversial at the time, but is now sort of normal, was it introduced using put and delete in addition to get and post. And there was conventions around the way that this would work. Um, and they decided to call this RESTful routing. Now, uh, historically, the people who are super into REST have not been the friendliest to people that do not understand REST. So I don't want to get an argument about what REST is specifically, but I'll just mention that like those things that Rails does is different than what Fielding's dissertation is about. And so there's some communications gaps uh, there. And that's good. That's fine. And the, the way that like the Rails-y REST is a great way to build applications, at least compared to the like random Wild West of things before. Um, but it's not actually like pure REST itself, which is sort of fine. Um, but it provided this convention-based approach to building APIs. Uh, one last side note about the whole Rails-y REST thing. It's kind of funny as someone who used to work on the web a decade ago to hear uh, web developers will never use anything but Git and Post because it's too complicated. And now a decade later, uh, web developers will never use hypermedia because it's too complicated. This whole thing, like I like to say that I believe in all of you. You are smart enough to understand these things. Uh, and so the, there's lots of arguments that these more advanced, quote unquote, API design techniques are like too much for the common programmer, which I think is totally absurd. Uh, anyway, so one of the big problems with this concept of conventions, though, um, and specifically with Rails, is that the conventions apply to the database as well as to the HTTP stuff. So what ends up happening with lots of Rails apps is you basically directly expose your database columns over the web to other people. We call this coupling in the software like architecture universe. Um, almost everything in like object-oriented programming theory is about how to reduce coupling or to hide your internals. Yet we've been building web applications where we share our database internals with other people. This makes refactoring very, very difficult. And it means change is very difficult. Because now all of this detail about the insides of your application are exposed to the outsides of your application. Um, so that's the bad side part and the, the, the bad downside of this particular style of design. Um, I'm going to shut up about Rails now. Um, but this is, I think, a very important point um, when it comes to how we build and design APIs. Because APIs are fundamentally about communication. It's kind of fun to accidentally screw up saying fundamentally and talking about communication stuff there. Um, and communication is about language. And language is about sharing. Um, so for example, right now, um, I, because I am from the States, only speak English. Haha, uh -huh, I'm embarrassed by this continually. Um, but we have, you know, even though we're in Spain, we've decided these presentations are going to be in English because that is a common language that we can all share in this particular context. I don't necessarily agree with that decision, but uh, I'll take advantage because English is kind of a terrible language. I'm really glad I learned it as my native one. It would be impossible. I, I'm so impressed by everyone that speaks multiple languages. Um, but uh, this idea of like languages being able to express ideas and share them with other people is also in our computer world. Um, we just call them protocols instead of languages. And these protocols sort of set up this space for you to explain things but from one computer to another. And what, what rules the protocol allows controls what ideas you're allowed to express in the same way that using English means that there's certain ideas that I can express particularly well or particularly poorly. And if I switch to Spanish, if I spoke it, uh, there are certain ideas that are easier to express in Spanish than there are in English, right? Because each language is good at different things for various reasons. 
Um, and so uh, this concept of protocols is very, very important for those of us that want to build you know, larger systems. Um, and good software design, in some ways, is all about these differences between protocols. Protocols aren't just something that happens over the network. Um, Smalltalk, the first object-oriented programming language, actually used the word protocols to describe how objects interact with each other in a system. And uh, that's also true. Uh, you know, some people talk about APIs, like in this context, as being over HTTP or over the network. But your code has APIs to other things, right? Like the Win32 toolkit is an API into Windows um, in the same way that uh, this web page is an API into a server hosted who knows where. Um, and so uh, it's important when we talk about protocols and communication to think about this like inside versus outside distinction. Um, first of all, because uh, like it's important because by keeping the internals and external parts separate, uh, you're able to rearrange the internals without affecting the rest of the system. This is important for refactoring in the like software development world, and it's important uh, to present your thoughts cohesively in this kind of situation, right? I, I had some internal dialogue about this topic, and then now I'm presenting it to you externally, but you don't have access to my internal private thoughts, thank God. Um, because, and that means we have much more effective communication. Um, because I can like rearrange my internal thoughts to uh, present it to you in a better way. Um, and we call this encapsulation, as I sort of mentioned before. Um, now, one of the things that would be unfortunate is if each particular one of us spoke a unique language that no one else spoke, right? That would be very, very hard. You would have to learn each person's language that you, when you wanted to talk to them. Uh, we in software call this non-scalable. Um, because you know you would have to do all of this learning every single time, um, and it would be effectively impossible to communicate. But while that sounds absolutely ridiculous in this like human languages sense, that's the way that we build APIs today. Every single service that you want to interact with uh, has its own special, bespoke, artisanal, handcrafted, free-range, uh, conflict-free, hopefully language and API implementation. And what this means is that every time you want to interact with a new API, you have to rewrite a brand new client that speaks its particular flavor of whatever thing it is that you're building. Um, so while we would never accept this concept of each individual human having an individual language in order to communicate effectively in the real world, in the computer world and of APIs, that's totally normal. And it's true that, that they're not completely different, right? Like, as mentioned before, we still all use HTTP. Uh, a lot of people use, like, I would bet if you put JSON and XML together, you would have 99.999% of all the public APIs. I did actually once work with a service that exposed YAML as its media type. That was fun. Um, yeah. Uh, but so for like productivity reasons, and because redoing work over and over again isn't any fun, um, we sort of try to build these different standards so that we can share things across services and not do as much work together. Um, and the process by which we do that is going through standards bodies like the W3C and IETF. I don't really have a whole lot of time to talk about them a whole lot more, except you should get involved in the web standards bodies and the various API standards bodies. Uh, arguing with people over the internet, over email, is maybe not the most productive use of your time, but it sort of affects your everyday life. Uh, because they are the people that set the rules for what you are allowed to do with your APIs over the networks. And so I would encourage you to get involved with standards bodies. Um, okay, enough theory. Let's move on to the actual history of this project that I have yet to define uh, specifically. Um, there's a thing that I like to try to remember, uh, and it's called kill your idols. And basically the idea is that um, when you start programming or when you get involved in these kinds of things, uh, it's very easy to look at people who, for example, may be on a stage speaking and think that they know everything. And I'm here to tell you that I, nor anyone else on the stage, knows everything there is to know about programming because that's absurd. Saying that out loud makes it sound kind of silly, but I know, at least for me, when I started getting involved in the broader industry, there were certain programmers whose work I really, really highly ex respected. And uh, I thought that they like, knew everything and were great. It's not that they're not great. Um, I'm going to pick a specific example here of someone who I'm lucky enough now to call a friend rather than idol, and that's uh, Yehuda Katz of Ember.js and Rails fame. When I first came across Yehuda's work, I was like, this person is brilliant. And I read every blog post he ever posted, and I watched every single conference talk he gave because I thought that he knew everything there was to know. 
Then I went to this conference called Mountain West Ruby Conference. And at that conference, after I gave a talk on hypermedia. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, hey, Steve, I, um, I'm not really convinced. Do you want to talk about it? Three hours of arguing later, he said, I think that you might have a point, uh, but I need to see some code later. And I went from Yehuda is an amazing godlike individual and knows everything about programming to, ha, I am an amazing godlike individual that knows everything about programming because my hero thought that I was wrong and now he thinks I'm right. Yes. Um, but I think it's important to remember that nobody actually completely knows what they're doing with computers because uh, computers are very hard. So uh, it's important to not idolize any particular person or strategy um, when it comes to computing. I bring this story up because that conversation is what ended up becoming JSON API years later. The reason that Yehuda asked me this question was because he was working on what eventually became Ember.js. And uh, if you're familiar with Ember.js as a framework, uh, it's a JavaScript framework for building ambitious web applications. And it was originally very heavily involved in the Rails world for a back end because Yehuda came from the Ruby universe. But he didn't want it to be just for Rubyists because there are a lot more people out there than Ruby programmers. I'm sure that there's a minority of people in this room that program in Ruby. Um, and a JavaScript framework that needs a specific back end technology is not a very good JavaScript framework. And so he was trying to figure out how do I make Ember agnostic for back end server technology? And he was trying to figure out ways of doing that. And so what I counseled him on, and eventually what we have done years later, um, is to standardize the HTTP semantics and the JSON specification for what Ember expects. And that way, any server-side technology can expose that particular JSON. And Ember or any other front-end technology that wants to use this particular format can expect to get that from a server, and it just works. I mean, this is kind of like the basics of building networked applications, right? Is that the protocol is the boundary by which your different services interact with each other. Um, and so this is what we did with JSON API. Now, that's the history of how this project worked, but it has since grown to significantly larger than the Ruby world and the Ember world. Um, the server side technologies are currently much more diverse than the client side technologies. But for example, I spent the better half of last year working for a company that used Python as a back end stack and exposed JSON API. So it's, even though I'm presenting it as this like Ember plus Ruby thing, it's actually not specific to that whatsoever. Um, but what we decided to sort of do was to take this concept of configuration over convention for Rails and apply it to APIs. So again, Every particular tech, like there's no one answer to any technical solution. So we decided to pick a particular strategy and execute on it well, rather than trying to be appropriate for every single API in existence. So um, JSON API as a standard is specifically useful for the pattern of, um, I have some objects on my server, I would like to share them with a client. How do we go about doing that? And that happens to be useful for the single page web application usage, but also in other like servers. Uh, non-JavaScript applications um, as well. And so we sort of decided like coming up with brand new JSON responses every single time is a whole lot of work. And it's fun to argue over the minutia of how your JSON is laid out, but it doesn't actually matter in like 99% of the instances. Um, we have a rule, uh, like a maxim in the programming world about these kinds of arguments. They call them the bike shedding rule. Uh, technically, the bike shedding rule is called Parkinson's Law of Triviality, which is incredibly trivial. So that makes me laugh every time I think about the difference between those names. But um, it's called bike shedding because the concept is it's significantly easier to argue about the color that a bike shed should be painted than it is to argue about the architecture of that bike shed in the first place. And so significantly more people will get involved in more trivial decisions. And generally speaking, the more trivial the decision, the more arguing people will do about it. Now, when I was preparing for this talk, I went on Google Images uh, and I searched for bike shed. And since then, it's changed slightly because Google search results change. But bear with me anyway. Uh, this one looks a little more reasonable. But when I first did this search, this was the first image on Google search results for bike shed, the second one over here. And I looked at it, and I was like, that's not a bike shed. And then I went, oh, damn it. I'm literally doing bike shedding about actual bike sheds. Um, it's like a place you can store bikes. Of course it's a bike shed. Um, but we as programmers love to do this. And um, one area that I've seen JSON API have a lot of uptake that I didn't initially think about, but makes perfect sense, is consulting companies. 
So consulting companies are often called in to build an API for a particular client, and so they don't get to just have the arguing over JSON conversation for every new release that comes out, like if you work at a product company. They get to have it every time they take on a new client. And uh, if you're doing well as a consulting company, that's pretty often. And so um, I've seen a lot of interest from people um, in using JSON API uh, in a consulting context, specifically because they can make similar APIs across all their projects and stop arguing about irrelevant details. Um, now, on the topic of irrelevant details, I have two fun things to show you about JSON API that are kind of like secrets. Um, one of them is the name. Uh, so when it came time to pick a media type that existed, uh, or to make a media type, sorry, that did not yet exist, um, we, we had to sort of pick a name for this project, and uh, we decided to call it JSON API uh, because no one had taken that name yet, basically. And uh, I think that JSON API is good for, again, we'll say 80% of APIs, but I don't think that it's appropriate for all of them. But there's a certain kind of programmer who, when you have a name that's this generic for something that's only 80% of things and not 100% of things, gets very, very upset. And the benefit is that when programmers get upset, they talk about it a lot. And so there's like specifically two or three people I can think of that actually like the spec but hate the name, and so they talk about it endlessly. And I even told one or two of them on point, like, Thank you for doing my marketing for me, man. Like, even if you criticize it all the time, please keep linking to this URL and saying how dumb the name is, because you're still spreading my URL anyway. Um, the second one, and this is my favorite, is a little less obvious, is if you note, the logo isn't actually valid JSON. Um, when we made the logo, <laughs> we included the quotes around the JSON and the API, but it actually looked a lot worse, like visually speaking. And so we decided to remove the quotes because it looks a little better, but it, it like, I, I just love, it's like an Easter egg that like the, the, it's not actually JSON. So the spec is actually JSON. It's a superset of JSON. It, it functions the same way as JSON is, but like the look of the logo, I just smile every time I look at it because it's just so funny to me. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so this is sort of the idea, is that by building conventions around the way that we build APIs, we can share vocabulary, which means that we cannot need to rebuild totally custom clients for every new service. And that also means that we can build shared tooling around these APIs as well. So shared language means you get shared tools. So for example, um, there is uh, a Ruby gem that will generate JSON API, there's actually multiple Ruby gems, that will generate JSON API for you from your models in a Rails app. And there are uh, Python packages and Node packages and other language packages as well. But it, uh, it helps you build the server and client sides of these because you can use them on multiple projects. And um, we've been working on this spec for about three years now. It's undergone a lot of production use over those three years. Um, I was joking earlier, it's really unfortunate, so I mentioned that I was working for a company that used Python that produced this. Uh, we processed credit card payments, and we were doing about a million dollars uh, a day of credit card processing through JSON API. But um, due to the Silicon Valley shenanigans, they actually were recently announced they were closing their doors, so I can't use that as an example anymore. It's kind of unfortunate. Uh, San Francisco is a weird place. Um, but uh, it was being used in production for that use case for a while, and the reason they're shutting the doors has more to do with the nature of venture capital than it does JSON. So, um, But there's a number of other places using this in production, um, and we're sort of releasing version 1.0 of the spec on the 21st of May. So it's been three years. But, uh, and we've been making changes along the way, but we've been really happy with what we have now. And so we are like setting this up as, uh, as a 1.0, and we're basically not going to break backwards compatibility ever in the future in the same way that HTML works. Um, so there's been a lot of interest around that. In addition, uh, Ember.js 2.0 is coming out June 15th with Ember Data 1.0, and it will be the default media type format for Ember Data as well. So. Um, I expect to see a significant more amount of production usage after that particular piece of tooling is in place. The server-side story has a lot of tooling. The client-side server story has a little bit less at the moment. Um, but now that we're sort of reaching this 1.0, people are starting to build and use these shared things. So um, I'm getting really excited about it. Um, the last thing I want to say about JSON API uh, is that, maybe not the last, I'll have to double check, triple check my notes, but I only have a couple minutes left, uh, is that JSON API, the reason this is in the hypermedia track is because JSON API encourages but does not require the usage of hypermedia in your API. 
So we sort of have this gateway drug mode where you can like, you don't have to use it at first, but there's advantages if you do. And we think that when you use those, you'll see the advantages and eventually switch over. So um, it's sort of an optional but encouraged component of this specification to use hypermedia. Um, so that's also uh, an example of just the practical work that I've done um, towards hypermedia stuff. Um, OK, that is all that I have for you uh, before lunch. I know everybody's always uh, you know, excited to get to lunch, so I will stop talking. Uh, again, thank you so much for having me, and I'd love to answer any questions you have about this. <laughs> Assuming we have time. Yeah, we, we have time. We have okay. time. Uh, but just, uh, you know, we, we, we follow the Spanish time, so we, we eat later. Ah, OK. I knew there was a break. Yeah, it's a break. It's a break. It's I true. travel so much that I actually don't have a metabolism anymore. I eat at weird times anyway, so it's, you know. But we will have uh, coffee and, and things to eat, yeah. yeah but, uh, Do we get a nap in the afternoon? Yeah, no. no. Uh. For the one who wants, but no, no. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have time for questions. Yes, we have a quick time for a question, yeah. Yeah, hi. Hello. Um, I'm a Rails guy, by the way. Sweet. So, uh, nice to meet you. Um, how popular is... Um, this particular implementation of JSON APIs, let's say on GitHub, or like how broadly accepted is it? How many contributors? Or so uh, one of the weird things about working on a specification is that you never quite know. So like I have a lot of people who have come up to me at conferences and said, "Hey, Steve, thanks. I built four APIs using JSON API last week," and I'm like, "Why didn't you email me a link to them sometime?" So I'm like constantly finding out about new people that are using it and people that are not. Um, I, I will say that uh, this is not like, you wouldn't be answer, asking me that question if it was incredibly well used, right? Because you would already know about it. So uh, this is definitely like a relatively small amount of usage from the like broad world of APIs. But we have a lot of people who are interested after 1.0. So there's been a lot of people who are saying like, I love the idea of this spec. I plan on using it. I'm not going to even read it until after you say that where it's not, it's not going to be changing at all anymore. So we're sort of like on the cusp of starting to encourage people to like actively put out products with this. So for that part of the, the life cycle of a project, I think that it has a relatively large amount of adoption. But in terms of like the broad universe, not that much. Um, but Yehuda and I have been like explaining this to people and we're working on more examples and tools and so like it is only growing. Yeah. Okay, and um, as far as I got you, um, Ember.js is consuming this like some sort of natively? Um, yeah. The default tooling will know how to consume this, and it will be the default format it expects with the next release. Okay, cool. Um, but Ember.js isn't like, it, it had some sort of um, popularity drop against Angular, doesn't it? Uh, I don't agree with that, but it's also internet arguing. I don't know. It's like okay, maybe we talk later. Yeah, totally. We can talk about that later about Ember versus Angular. Uh, yeah, Ember versus Angular. Great, great debate. Um, yeah, what's a question here? Yeah, hi. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Uh, I'm Matt. Hey. Uh, we'll talk later uh, more details, but I quickly overlooked the uh, form, uh, format page of uh -huh. the JSON API spec, and it kind of uh, reminded me the JSON LD and collection plus G JSON. Sure. Uh, could you give us some insights about the quick differences between those JSON LD, JSON API, collection plus JSON? Yeah. So every single one of the various, there's, there's a ton of different formats that are sort of like JSON with some hypermedia involved. And each particular one of them has sort of chosen what they're going to be good at. So JSON LD. Uh, specifically is trying to sort of, um, I, I don't, I'm not a fan, the biggest fan of JSON LD, so I try to represent it accurately instead of trollily. They're trying to reinvent the semantic web without the bad parts of the semantic web in JSON, right? So, uh, so they're really interested in this idea of ontologies and like linking ontologies to data and stuff. That's not an approach that I am a particular fan of, but some people are, and that's their thing. Collection, collection plus JSON uh, is specifically trying to sort of be the new atom. They're focused on, here's a collection of things. Let's manipulate that collection, right? Uh, HAL is attempting to be this minimal hypermedia addition to JSON. 
Um, so what you sort of need to do to evaluate between all of these different formats is to sort of figure out what you're trying to do with your API, look at the reason that each spec has developed, and pick the one that aligns the most closely with the thing that you're trying to accomplish. So for example, I think that collection plus JSON is fantastic for things like search results, because that's generally a collection of things that you want to sort and filter and do stuff like that. Um, so JSON API is sort of like one sentence reason to exist is, I have objects on the server, I'd like to send them to a client, and I'd like the client be able to do CRUD on them. So if that's the kind of thing that you're doing, this might be better for you than other approaches. If you're doing something else, one of those other specs might be better. It depends on what you're doing. Question here. Hi. Uh, is there any plan to support write actions? Yeah. Yet? So writing, so all of the standard CRUD style stuff is the sort of bread and butter of this spec. So um, updating things and updating them efficiently. So we have, for example, semantics for massively updating multiple records at the same time and things like that. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a big part of this, definitely. One more question. I will take it. Uh, cool. You know, the, 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 payment, um, the payment company that was using JSON API, yeah. uh, why, you told me they reach you to say, oh, we, we like uh, JSON API and, and we want to use it. What was the, let's say, the, in the, I wouldn't say business or technical arguments really about choosing JSON API and, and wanting to have you implement it, like for them, for a payment company? Yeah, yeah. so for a payment company using JSON API, basically um, the company's name was Balanced Payments, if you want to look them up. Uh, and basically the, the, the reason, the thing that attracted them um, about this is that they are very heavily invested in the concepts of standards and like working towards shared open source stuff. Um, we had a, uh, especially in payments, uh, one of the big problems is that everything is like closed source and private and there's ridiculous arcane rules around payment stuff. I mean, not all of them are ridiculous, but like they're definitely uh, lots of them. And so Balance as a company was trying to add a lot of openness to the payment space. So a significant amount of our code was open source, and we we're very interested in like working with open standards and making the payment space, generally speaking, more open. So when it came time to build an API, they were like, what standards exist in the API space? And they saw what we were doing and liked it, um, okay. basically. Um, so it was part of the general philosophy of openness. Um, as one small example of how that worked in another context, all of our product roadmap and feature development was done through GitHub issues in public. Um, and so that was kind of the like uh, reason that they were using us. Okay, so thank you for transparency. So thank you, Steve. Um, thank you. Some applause for Steve, please. Thanks so much.